Hello, welcome to the meeting tent. Uh, this is a, a series of programs uh, discussing the work of Stan Tenen, research director of Meru Foundation, who sadly left us earlier this year. We're recording this in May of 2022. And before we begin discuss, talking about Stan and our relationship to him and to the work, I'd like to throw out a question uh, to Daniel and Michael. Why are we doing this? Why are we spending our valuable time? Why is this important? And, and Daniel, I'll start with you. So maybe it was like maybe three months ago, four months ago was uh, when Stan was still in the world. And we, we had a conversation, maybe it was like six months ago. It was within the last year. And uh, Stan said something peculiar to me, uh, which I always appreciate. Um, and, uh, but, you know, something surprising, uh, even for our normal conversations, he said, you know, I think, I think all of this is somehow in the merit of your father, uh, everything I'm doing. And I just, it like blew me away. It still blows me away. And I thought that's really peculiar. I said, well, that's very, thank you. That's very gracious. I, I didn't, I don't know what he meant, but I've been thinking, I think about, you know, I th thought a lot about it. Like every, th every conversation I had with Stan, uh, I think, th think a lot about it, you know? Um, so I think, I think what he meant, or, I mean, and who knows, but I think, I think what he was saying is, and he'd mentioned this before earlier in our many years ago, is, is that my dad was a Holocaust survivor. And I think, I think what he was getting at is that this material has something to do with the rectification the world needs to go through in response to, to the Holocaust and, and specifically with the Jewish people, but also for the entire world. And his meeting my father, I think may, might've made that clear to him. Uh, and so, I, and I know, you know, as the son of a Holocaust survivor, I feel there's much beauty uh, in, in the literature of Judaism and uh, in, in the thought and the deep, the deep thought that's there, uh, almost fathomless in a way. Um, but there are certain things when you see them or when you encounter them, you say, well, okay, if this is the future of Judaism, then somehow all of the, the past and the pain, somehow, you know, it might actually make sense to some degree. It might somehow, it might start to make it somehow make sense. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know, it's probably the highest praise I can give. Uh, yeah. That's why it's important to me. Yeah. Um, I, I, I will only add, um, I hadn't known that Stanley had said that to you, but I'm absolutely not surprised. Um, I know that your father's life as your father related to, to us one evening when it was just your dad and your mom, you weren't there around our dining room table. And, you know, we just talked. Um, impressed Stanley very, very deeply in his heart. And it was also how your father lived because he ultimately chose life. And that was the most I think that's the most important thing that Stanley would want to convey with his own life as a whole um, is choose life. And it's that contact with your dad just reached very deeply into his soul. Mm -hmm. And I know that, that Stanley would want to give something back in his memory. I know that. Two things that it occurs to me um, in regard to things that Stan talked about. Uh, regarding the Holocaust was that people constantly say, well, why don't we know about this work? Why don't we, if this is so important and this is so intrinsic in Judaism or, or the history or the, the development, why don't we know this? And basically his statement was that we did in certain parts of Eastern Europe, there were small groups that had these ideas. 
that were distinguished, I mean, extinguished, I'm sorry, that were extinguished with the Holocaust. They were both. They were distinguished and extinguished. There you go. So what's interesting about that is that the most explicit, I mean, the Shefatal spells out the reciprocal spiral and the, the, hand, the, the hand model and says it is the form of the spherot and of the entire process, both the large and the particular. And the Shefatal is the first book to print the hands in the book. And its entire introduction deals with the hand. And what people don't know uh, is that the is that Shefatal was, I think, the second often most printed book in Eastern Europe before the Holocaust, other than like the Torah of the Chumash the five books of Moses. Uh, so it, it, it's very, very likely that that is actually the case. Uh, and because th there are so many corollaries in, the, in Shefatal in terms of how he lays out the alphabet and in terms of, of the hands being, I mean, that's absolutely central to him. It's how he starts the book. And then in terms of the, the hand model, the reciprocal spiral, which he spells out, which he obviously knew about in the 16th century. Um, so it's, it's, it's not far-fetched, actually, and I think that it, it's 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 likely. The the, uh, the things that uh, Daniel's referring to, we'll be discussing in more detail, and there are videos and and of uh, the book, which I'll show you on the screen right now. Uh, we'll be referring to quite a bit, but um, so Michael, let's have your um, your impressions on why are we doing this, Stan. To me, and I'm, I'm a newbie to this, unfortunately, I wish I had had the 20 plus, 30 plus years that you folks have, but I haven't. Uh, I just came across his work um, <laughs> less than a year ago and uh, uh, bought his book. And before I finished uh, reading it, I was already looking for a phone call because I needed to talk to him. And Stan was unique, and I've been blessed in my life to have met a few people like him, each in their own world, who were not reflections of what they had learned, but were sources. There's a blessing that you make at a bris that says, this little one should become big. And you think, well, that's not much of a blessing. Of course, we want a little one to become big. You know, you want him to be wise. You want him to be, uh, have a great living. You want to have love in his life. But little one should become big. You feed him, he gets big. But the deeper meaning is that little in that respect is the same as it was used for the first time in the Torah, which means the moon. The moon was katan. It was small. The sun was gadol. It was big. Now, of course, if you look in the sky and you don't know about distance and so on, they're both about the same size, even though one gets smaller and bigger and the other one stays big. But what it's saying is that the moon is a reflection of light and the sun is a source of light. There are certain people who knew how to connect. They didn't plan it out that way usually. Sometimes they may have worked at it in a way that they didn't even realize they were working at it where they connect to something bigger and higher and become a source of light. And as I say, I, there are, are two people that I can point to in my life other than Stan that I felt that way uh, about. And of course you want to preserve what came from that source. And I don't mean him, I mean the source that he connected to, to channel it into the world. Because I don't have the history, I can only look at the big picture because he kept saying to me, well, finish the book, the last two <laughs> chapters especially. And he kept pointing me to the last two chapters and the last two chapters connected with me in a big way because they were about the uh, man's inhumanity to man and how we had to get rid of the ego and not do unto others what we would not have them want to do unto us, the golden rule in many languages and many expressions throughout the world. 
And second, that it all led to a global unity, oneness, healing, wholeness, healing, that was where he envisioned his work would be pointed. <laughs> and when I talked to him about that in the far too few conversations that we had, he reinforced that in conversations with Lavana after that and with, with you guys. Um, he, yeah, that's, that's where he was headed. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what got him to there? How did he get to that? He didn't start out with that. He started out looking at a bunch of letters and was not such a great bar mitzvah student, so he could barely read the Hebrew. He certainly couldn't read the words, but when he put them together, this first peak experience, and by that I mean P-E-E-K as well as P-E-A-K, he had a peak into something way deeper, way higher. And then when he began to connect it to uh, the letters and the hand model and the seed that bears fruit, that bears seeds, that, and round and round we go, uh, all of which are discussed in the book. And if you have a background in Judaism, Christianity, uh, quantum physics, and uh, sacred geometry, you'll have no trouble reading the book. <laughs> but if well, you a don't, <laughs> yeah, a little trouble, but if you don't, it's going to take some of these uh, sessions that we're recording that might provide a, a key, like a Hammurabi code, right. into what he was. I, I want to know how he got there. Okay. Well, but at Michael, the same time, more so, I want to get to where he was. Where, he, where was he going? Right. So let's use that as a segue. And uh, let's talk about Stan. Uh, many people watching this initially will have come across his work, even met Stan and Lavana, uh, but some haven't, but for some reason uh, were interested in it and decided to pursue following his work. But let's talk about Stan Tannen. Lavana, I don't know. Now we understand this is a little bit painful for you. Stan has only been gone a few months. You guys were like, Magnus, and you were part of it. You were part of the whole thing from the beginning. But do you want to talk about Stan just even before you met him, his background, who he is? Oh, well, let's see. Uh, from before I met him, uh, he grew up in Brooklyn, born in 1942. He was a firstborn son. And if you know anything about the culture and, and the times, you can imagine that even though he didn't really understand it, who would uh, at that age, um, there were people in his family who regarded him as insanely important because he was firstborn son and he was alive um, during World War II. Enough said about that. Um, he was always a sensitive kid, I guess you could say, um, interested in why things worked. He described to me once that uh, when he was, I guess, under 10, he took apart a typewriter and put it back together again, had about five parts left over, but it still worked. He was that kind of kid who always wanted to to fit things together. He was an inventor. He was a splot thinker in that he would see things all at once and then have a difficulty explaining them to people who needed to see them explained sequentially. Um, and frankly, uh, the book that people keep talking about, which is the book that we wrote back in uh, 2009 to 2011 or so, uh, called The Alphabet That Changed the World, How Genesis Preserves a Science of Consciousness in Geometry and Gesture. Um, anyone who reads that book will see that he was a somebody who saw things all at once. Um, when what did else can I when, say? When did you guys meet? When did you guys meet? We met. Uh, 
geez, we met in 71 and basically have been together, we're together since uh, October of 1972. So he just passed away January in January 22. Um, so we were together for almost 50 years. Um, we, I don't know really quite what else to say in terms of, of um, how I got involved with this. Of course, A, we were together. And B, although he and I, in personality and affect, were, were pretty much polar opposites, um, deep in our core, uh, we saw and felt the same direction. And that's something that I knew from the very beginning, even when I didn't know how the hell I knew it. You know, it was just there. Um, and so I followed that um, for 50 years. Right. So you're going to be a, a huge source of information for us um, as an eyewitness to how these things developed. Yeah. yeah. And so that that's what we're looking forward to. Um, I'll go next because I think I'm the next in line in terms of meeting Stan. I grew up born and raised in San Francisco. So I, I grew up in an orthodox environment, but like many of my generation, found a lot of hypocrisy in it and kind of blew it up. Uh, it, the way we were taught, it was uh, the mid fifties uh, and there's a lot of reasons why things were the way they were. Uh, and then I, like many of my generation exploring other uh, philosophies, ideas, faiths, mostly Eastern because it felt good. It, 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 there was a, a resonance with a lot of the Buddhist and other Eastern teachings. Uh, but I, in terms of joining, I, I never was a joiner and I didn't feel that close to it. Then in the early eighties, there were uh, some books that were uh, coming out regarding Kabbalah, which I had never heard about. Why did I go to six years of Hebrew school and never hear of this branch of Judaism? Why did they leave that out? And when I started reading, I started seeing correlations with these Eastern ideas. I could, I was blew me away. As many of you who now subsequently know about Kabbalah had the same reaction, I'm sure. So I felt like I wanted to do something. I, I wanted to help spread the word. And I had some ideas on how to do that. And um, through a series of circumstances, I went to a all night Shavuot sitting and as I got a friend and said, you got to meet this guy, because uh, I told him what I was up to. He says, you won't understand a word he's talking about, but it's really interesting. So I said, all right, I went. I, so I went, I'm sitting there in Marin. I kept thinking, when can I leave? When can I leave? Uh, but I ended up staying the whole night and then uh, introduced to Stan. And I told him I wanted to do this. Uh, I, I wanted to interview me him, and, and he looked at me like, uh, here's another one, you know, another new age, you know, hippie who you know, doesn't. But then I said, yeah, I want to ask you questions like, what is light? Uh, and he just, oh, he lit, I mean, lit up. It was like the reaction was like from, ah. And so we met. And at the same time, I was starting a, a video production business in San Francisco. So the correlation was perfect. We started videotaping and I became, if you go to our, our video websites, you'll see my name all over the videos. Uh, so I was, uh, I was the person who, and, and, and again, I didn't understand. I, I'm not, my background was not physics or math, history, my majors political science, arts, film. So the math and the physics eluded me. The rabbinic, the Judaism, I was very interested in. Um, so it took me a while and today, uh, you know, I'm still limited, uh, but I can talk about it a lot, a lot better than, than I could before. So I was part of the foundation. I became president of the board for a number of years. So here we are today and uh, feeling uh, that the relevance is stronger than ever. 
uh, it always has been. And we'll talk about more of how things progressed over the years, but uh, that's my story. So let's turn it over to Daniel and how you connected with this. So uh, when we moved to Sharon, uh, gosh, Massachusetts. I, Sarah, Mass yeah, like Sharon, Massachusetts, like uh, gosh, 22 years ago. So uh, when we first got here, um, you know, I was getting, we were in Jerusalem before that. And so uh, I was, it was kind of, uh, you know, not, not culture shock, but you know, it's different, very different to suburban America. It's quite different than uh, a kind of mixed, both Haredi and, and uh, more religious and also kind of some secular people in Jerusalem. It's quite a different scene. So a friend of mine said, you know, a uh, mutual friend actually said, you know, you, you have you met, have you heard of Stan Tennant? I said, no. So well, you should go meet him. I said, okay. So that, uh, that was in my, I had, that was in my always say yes time i had there was a, there's an old hasidic doctrine that you should always say yes so kind of, anyway that's another story but anyway so i it was actually you know you learn quite a bit when you do that so so i said sure and uh i not knowing not knowing anything and i remember um my parents were in town at the time and my mom was up when i got home and i was just like blown away not like i didn't understand i didn't understand the mathematics um, but I understood, like similar to what Bill said, I understood the rabbinics, and I, I even more than that, I, I, there was some sort of import, some sort of something really, some sort of really, really deep that just went like, wow, like so deep that it was almost like scary. I was like, this is like too much for me, like uh, wow, you know, coming from being pretty strictly orthodox when we lived in Jerusalem, it was just like it was mind blowing. So I talked it over with my mom, and she said, she said an amazing thing. She said. I'm not sure why, but this has something to do with Rabbi Akiva and his legacy. And mm -hmm. I went, I went, it was, was just amazing. And, and she, I think she's, she's like exactly right. Mm -hmm. I think this is a part of Rabbi Akiva's heritage that has been lost over the years. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I don't want to get, not, not the time and place to get into that, but I think she was really right on. And, and so I kind of went, you know, wow. I think yeah, that's amazing. And I went to sleep. And then that's that's how that's how we started. And we just sat and talked and imbibed and uh and uh, ate yummy things and and just had a great time. And uh and uh just you know, it was it's yeah, so that's how we met and I'm and, and then, then it you built. Wrote some, and then you wrote some music for us. And oh, of course. And then Stan says, Stan says, okay, there's music, there's a there's music here. And I said, oh, I got, I don't want to write something. And so so he said, No, just come listen. And, and you had that program that would go through and um yeah, and we, had, we, we had you know basically transcribed each letter of the alphabet 27 with the finals at the end to a simple, you know, 12 note musical scale. That's it, the, the scale everybody's used to. And we only had, I don't know, we didn't go very far into the text. I think we had, ultimately we had like 2000 or so letters or so, but anyway, you can hear something in that, your turn. Yeah, yeah, that's what happened. And so he said, just, just listen to it. I said, okay, fine, I'll listen to it. And then uh, I'll never forget that. And he played it for me and I went, Okay, there's a pattern there. I can work with. Got it. Fine, I'll do it. You know, like I, I don't know. Maybe composers are naturally lazy or something. I don't know. I just didn't <laughs> want to get into it. So, so, but I, but I, but once, I, once I heard that, I went, okay, that's I, that's a real pattern, and it's the fact that it's audible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then I, then I, I came up with a composition, a system of composition, uh, which I called the. Um, the uh, biblical commentary or the musical commentary system and uh, could be used for any text, but I think it's especially interesting with the Torah. It's a real system of composition, very simple, but very works quite well. And I, I employed it for the um, for for this piece for the first three uh, verses uh, of the Bible of, of the Chumash of the five books of Moses. And uh, I will tell you that Stan said something also that impressed me. He said, you know, everything comes from that first decision. 
Mm -hmm. It's what you, when you make that first decision, then everything kind of flowers out of it. And decisions are like that, which that relates to the Sfirot and, and, and the Kabbalah and this Kabbalistic cosmology also very deeply um, and in a fascinating way. But uh, so I said, okay, so I, I got the system down and I made my first decision and it was like I was taking dictation. From that point on, I mean, it, I mean, all pieces do that at a certain point, they write themselves, but this was like instant. And so I wrote it and we recorded it, it was unbelievable. And it's a great piece of music and I'm very honored to have done it. But what's, what I went back and said, you know, what, maybe, maybe I'll keep going with it. And I did the next two psukim and the presence of whatever was dictating was so strong that again, it was overwhelmingly frightening because it was literally like there was someone in the room with me writing this and the vert and the music got more and more and more and more complex and also more reflective of the text itself uh and so it's it's almost like it, it just it, it it's really real like and as a musician i i really it just blew me away uh, again i think you know at some point I'd, I'd love to go back and do and and keep going but it 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 just, it made me go, you know what, I'm going to just put this aside for a while because it's so powerful. And um, yeah, anyway, okay, I rambled on. But well, we're, we're, we're going to provide links to the music uh, so people can hear. Uh, and and uh, is it on YouTube? Um, oh, cool. Yeah, there, yeah. There's, yeah. yeah, there's a couple, there's a couple uh, YouTube. There's one where I, I, I have a video of the, um, uh, of the kind of recording process. And then you can see a live, it's not really a mixed, it's not mixed, but you can see the orchestra playing. And, and then, um, and then there's another one, which is just kind of the mixed version is up there. So. Okay, so we'll provide yeah. links to that. Yeah. Um, okay, Michael, so you already uh, alluded to the book. And that's kind of, I, I assume that's what drew you into this? Or is um, it a story? It is. And I think the most striking thing um, is the very strong sense from early on in the book that Stan and I, or the knowledge that came from him, through him, was in many ways almost like a DNA strand, and I was another strand, going through similar discoveries, knowing some of the same people along the way that he encountered and yet never meeting or encountering each other. Um, uh, my background, I grew up Orthodox, went to Yeshiva right through Yeshiva University. I'm a Moyle. Um, I'm a- What's a Moyle? Arts. A Moyle oh, does yeah. ritual circumcision, yes. Um, yeah, we do need to kind of translate. I was wondering, um, Lavana, if you felt it was necessary for our younger viewers to explain what a typewriter is. <laughs> uh, Probably. It kind of looks like that a is, keyboard, but noisier. I don't yeah. think it's that extreme. And it's got a zillion, a zillion little bitty parts to it with little yeah, bitty screws yeah. that all have to hinge at the... Yeah, it's not well, one I'll chip a, that you put in and it works. I'll anyway. put up a picture of one. Yeah, you should. <laughs> so, um, but with martial arts and yoga and energy healing, which I wrote my book on, and being a theater guy, I came to this, you know, people would say, oh, he's a Jewish shaman, you know, because I was doing all of these different things. And as I moved along, my work was practice. Like, what do I do? You can't just talk about being a moil. You have to know what you're doing. You can't put on a show unless you know the the parameters and the skills and so forth. And the same thing with martial arts. You don't just go up and hit the stone and it breaks. You have to have skills. And I was always oriented toward, okay, how do we do that? How do we do that? And yet the pictures in my own peak experiences and in my own life paralleled so many times with what Stan was doing that I had to talk to the guy because it was just really, I mean, overwhelmingly strange. I dealt with the Aleph bet and I dealt with a, a circle of letters and things that were in his book that are also in mine. <laughs> and it was uh, a thrill and an honor to be able to talk to him, unfortunately, too few times. And 
since it was toward the end of his life, it was challenging for him to carry on conversations. But, you know, he was all the times, you know, saying to Lavana, hey, send him this. Hey, send him that. Hey, <laughs> you know, I would mention something and he would have the parallel before I even expressed it. And it went both ways. And so, like I said before, people like that who bring uh, the source and not the reflections, which has been done over and over and over again, it becomes habitual to the point where we stop paying attention to it. I mean, I was told from the time I was a kid, and I'm sure in the years that, that Dan was in the yeshiva in Israel, how many times do you hear daven with kavona, pray with intent? And in 16 years, I heard it hundreds, if not thousands of times, and nobody ever taught me how until I met another one of those source people, Chaim Sober, professor of Hebrew and biblical archaeology and a grand master of Chinese martial arts, who put together the Jewish philosophy with the Asian technique. He was a synthesizer, as was Stan. Stan could pull together from as wide a um, a smorgasbord as I can imagine. Uh, his book certain reflects that as he goes back and forth and circles through and again and again. It's woven beautifully. If you haven't read the book, it's worth reading. Just to see how he um, unpacks um, certain pieces of wisdom on a progressive way, deeper and deeper. And I knew that I had to uh, to meet him. So for me, it was very late. It was a confirmation for me that I wasn't completely nuts in my thinking. And maybe he enjoyed our conversations because I was in a little way that for him, that he could hear this stuff and say, hey, this is like two laboratories on different parts of the planet doing experiments and coming up with the same conclusion, even though they never talk to each other. And that was very exciting. What's the name of your book, Michael? Mine, uh, The Essential Guide to Energy Healing. Okay, we'll put up a link for that. Yeah. There's a loud bird out here who's- uh, <laughs> Okay, uh, I, will, I will mute myself um, just <laughs> after I make one particular point, which is- No, you don't have to mute. No, the bird's here. Is it- No, the bird is here. Oh, okay. No, oh, okay. It's, it's somebody- <laughs> Maybe wants there's to birds everywhere. Here. Somebody wants to chime in here and wants to have like a voice heard. He speaks exactly. through words. And, you know, what I wanted to add at the time and just, you know, the, the way he connected things, he was, what he saw was process. And he would see an underlying process that was congruent in all of these different fields that, as you say, he touched on. Um, and uh, so that's how he was connecting things was process. Now this process, I mean, you know, towards the end of his life, he was doing, you know, a fair amount with analyzing words and, and, uh, and certain kinds of gematria and so on. And that's like a whole separate discussion. Um, but some of the clues to his process were numbers that showed up. Um, you know, uh, I, okay, whole, whole different topic. You know, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll definitely want to talk about that. I think what we're going to do is we're going to end this episode. And next episode, we're going to be talking about the, the hand model specifically. And as uh, we develop, our, our goal here is to unlock a puzzle, is to bring in pieces of what Stan used to say, a jigsaw puzzle of whatever, a reality or whatever you want to call it. Um, if anybody watching this uh, wants to chime in, give us some feedback, I'll put the, uh, my email address uh, here. If somebody wants to appear as a guest and uh, chime in and give their two cents, uh, we'll be glad uh, to, to listen to what you have to say. So thank you guys, and we look forward to our uh, next episode on the meeting tent. Take care. Bye.